emphasize something, that's a good phrase, George. Of course. Of course. Okay. Now, all you have to do to earn more money in the same time is simply become more valuable. America's unique. It's a ladder to climb. Starts down here, what? About $4 an hour? Big argument last year in Congress about the starting place. Should be five, should be five, should be five. Well, no, it doesn't need to be five. Why not start with four? It's a ladder. Right? This is not a bed. This is a ladder. It's a ladder to climb. Starts at four dollars. Now somebody says, well, should be five, should be five. Well, maybe. If you're gonna stay at the bottom for the rest of your life, it probably should be five. But that's kind of a pitiful way to live. Start and not grow. Start and not change. Start and not become more valuable. Hey, the whole scenario of life is to start, number one, and what? Become more valuable, number two. So America's a ladder to climb. Starts at $4 an hour, and the more valuable you become, you just keep moving up the ladder. Top income last year, what, 52 million? Guy that runs Disney? Would a company pay somebody for one year's work $52 million? And the answer is, of course. This is one of those of course places. Of course. If you help a company make a billion dollars, would they pay you $52 million? The answer is, of course. It's chicken feed. I mean, it's not much money. Now, why that much money? Because he has become so valuable now why would we pay somebody only four dollars an hour they're not very valuable to the marketplace now we got to make that distinction to the marketplace might be a valuable brother a valuable member of the community valuable member of the church valuable member in the sight of god to the human family of course those kind of values but to the marketplace which is called what reality Reality is, if you're not very valuable, you don't get much money. Those are called the facts. <laughs> I mean, that's how that is. Well, then how do you get more money? Simple answer. Somebody says, well, I'll go on strike for more. Well, here's a major problem with that. Here's a major problem with that. You can't get rich by demand. Somebody says, well, I'm waiting for a raise. I'm telling you it's easier to climb than to wait for a raise. Why not just become more valuable rather than wait? I'm telling you that's the key to all good things. Becoming more valuable. Why would we pay somebody $400 an hour? They've become more valuable to the marketplace. See how this works? I'm telling you, this stuff is so easy. This is America. This is a ladder. How far is it from four to five? I'm telling you, it's not far. Four to five dollars an hour? If you work for McDonald's, haul out the trash, they'll pay you five dollars an hour. If you whistle while you haul out the trash, they'll pay you five dollars an hour, I'm telling you. You'll get an extra dollar just for a good attitude. Yay, McDonald's. Wear the hat. It's incredible. Five dollars. And then you just keep becoming more valuable, more valuable, more valuable. I got a telephone call five years ago. The company said, we're ready to expand internationally. We need some help. I was sort of semi-retired. Right? Looking for the next exotic beach. They said, no, no, Mr. Rohn. We got a project for you. Right. We're going to expand internationally. We could use your help. Next little while, we'll add a f some millions to your fortune, make it worth your while. I said, okay. <laughs> I thought later, isn't that interesting that they called me? My second thought was, of course they'd call me. Who else would they call? I mean, you know, <laughs> I can get the job done. Now, how come? How come I got a telephone call worth millions? I had become valuable. Now, I'm a farm boy from Idaho. I was raised in obscurity. 
one year of college and I thought I was thoroughly educated. Made all kinds of mistakes galore. At age 25, the creditors are calling me saying, hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I got pennies in my pocket. I got nothing in the bank. I'm behind on my promises. How come I get a telephone call five years ago and it's worth millions? I changed. I changed. I turned my life around. Is it possible to become worth millions? Speaking economically, now there's a lot of values to become, but let's just talk economics. Is it possible to become that valuable? And the answer is... Of course, of course. Now, let me give you the secret. Shelf said, here's the secret, Mr. Rohn. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I got that, it turned my life around. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. He said, if you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. If you would have known me at age 25, you would have said, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. If you'd have known me, you'd have said that. I'm the guy, I don't mind coming a little bit early, staying a little bit late, I don't mind that. You'd have said, well, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. You say, well, how come he's got pennies in his pocket and nothing in the bank and behind on his promises? Well, I was a hard worker, but I was working hard on my job, not on my so, I'm telling you, if you'll learn that simple little principle and start the process today, latest tomorrow, I'll give you tonight to think it over. <laughs> and start this whole process of personal development, work on yourself, make yourself more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, you can so dynamically change your income and economics is the least of the values that you can start earning in terms of equity. If you'll start working harder on yourself than you do on your job. Work hard on yourself and develop the skills. Work hard on yourself and develop the graces. All of the stuff necessary to become more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, your whole life can explode into change. Promotions, no problem. Becoming more valuable to the company, I'm telling you, no problem. Money, no problem. Economics, no problem. Future, no problem. If you just go to work on the right thing, not get things out there to change. Don't try to change the seed. Don't change the soil. Don't change the sunshine. Don't change the rain. Don't change the mix of seasons. Let the miracle of everything that's available work for you and start working on the inside. Work on your philosophy. Work on your attitude. Work on your personality. Work on your language. Work on the gift of communication. Work on all of your abilities. And if you'll start making those personal changes, I'm telling you, everything will change for you. Now, let me give you another scenario on personal development. It's called the four major lessons in life to learn. Before we get to the four major lessons in life to learn, let me give you a key phrase for your notes. Here it is. Life and business is like the seasons. Life and business is like the seasons. Frank Sinatra sings, life is like the seasons. Now, here's one of the key phrases that changed my life. Starting at age 25, you can see this whole scenario. Personal development for me began. I've never been the same since. Here's the next key phrase. You cannot change the seasons, but you can change yourself. You can't change the seasons, but you can change yourself. My best hope, right? When I'm 25 years old, my best hope was to go through the day with my fingers crossed saying, I sure hope things will change. I sure hope things will change. It seemed to be my only way for my life to get better if things would change. Here's what I discovered. It isn't going to change. It isn't going to change. I did a seminar one time for Standard Oil executives and management in Honolulu, now known as Chevron. And we're talking economics one day around the conference table. And one of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, you know some fairly important people around the world. You have a chance to travel internationally. Can you tell us what you think the 80s are going to be like? Now you can tell how far back this goes. He said, what do you think the 80s are going to be like? And I thought for a moment and I said, gentlemen, I do know the right people. And I do have some experience, I think I can tell you. So they all leaned in a little closer and I said, gentlemen, based on the people I know and based on the best of my own experience, I think in the 80s, it's going to be about like it's always been. 
Aren't you glad you came today? I mean, that's inside stuff. I don't just spread that around everywhere. It's going to be about like it's always been. It isn't going to change. To hope that it'll change is called whistling in the wind, being so naive, hoping for something that isn't going to occur. I can give you the shortest history lesson that you can imagine in one sentence. What describes human history on the spinning planet the last six and a half thousand years? Let me describe it for you in one sentence. Here's human history in one sentence. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. That's about as simple as you can put it. And opportunity mixed with difficulty isn't going to change. The man says, well, if it isn't going to change for the future, if it isn't going to change in the 90s, how will my life ever change? Answer, when you change. And if you will change, everything will change for you. Your bank account will change, your income will change, your future will change. The ability to acquire your dreams will change. It'll all change if you will change. And now let's go through the scenario of the seasons. Life and business is like the seasons. Let's cover them. Here's number one, major lesson in life to learn. Learn how to handle the winters. You say, well, Mr. Rohn, a lot of this stuff is fairly obvious. That's true. Just need somebody like me just to come along and remind us. This is what this is called today, a reminding session. I got no new truth for you to discover. This is all old stuff. We just need to hear it again. Somebody get on our case a little bit, right? We all need that. Here's number one lesson. Learn how to handle the winters. That's obvious. The winters come right after falls. And pray tell how often? Every year, according to written history, for the last six and a half thousand. To cross your fingers and say, I hope, I hope, I hope it doesn't come. I'm telling you, we call that naive. Now, there's all kinds of winters, not just the winter of the season, but there's all kinds of winters, winter time, the down time, the discouraging time. One writer called it the winter of discontent, the winter when you can't figure it out, the winter when it all goes wrong. Economic winters, social winters, political winters, and personal winters. When your heart is smashed in a thousand pieces, the nights are unusually long. It's called winter time. Barbara Streisand sings, it used to be so natural to talk about forever, but used to be's don't count anymore. They just lay on the floor till we sweep them away. You don't sing me love songs. You don't say you need me. And you don't bring me flowers anymore. A song of winter. But hey, we're acquainted with all those winter scenarios. We've been through them all. <coughs> Now the question is, what do you do about the winters? Well, you can't get rid of January by tearing it off the calendar. But here's what you can do with the upcoming winters of your life, the long ones, the short ones, the easy ones, the more difficult ones. Here's what you can do. Get wiser and stronger and better. Just make a list of that trio of good words. Wiser, stronger, and better. To challenge for yourself the upcoming winters of your life, don't you think you could read more? Pick up the scenario, pick up the books, Pick up the cassettes, so I would put some stuff on cassettes so you can listen to it, put it in books so you can read it. Now putting it on video so you can see it. I'm telling you, anybody that wants to can get wiser. Next is stronger. Anybody can get stronger. If you're willing to do the push-ups, you can get stronger. If you're willing to put yourself through the paces, you can get stronger. Can you develop stronger skills? And the answer is yes. Start practicing, practicing, practicing. And you can get stronger. Can you get stronger in handling life situations? Of course. But you've got to go to work on yourself. You can't blame out there wishing it was easier. Wish you were stronger. And here's the last one, get better. Anybody can get better. Language, we can all get better. I've been lecturing now for 33 years, and I'm telling you, today versus 33 years ago, I'm better. First time I gave a talk, I stood up, my mind sat back down. I mean, you know, I've been through that whole deal. Open my mouth, nothing came out for a while. My knees are banging together, the sweat's pouring off my face, I'm shaking like a leaf. It's called terror, in case you haven't tried it. <laughs> Those first attempts. But I'm telling you, I got through it, and I did it again, and I got through it, and I did it again, and I got through it. And now, of course, I can lecture for a few hours in one day. Anybody can get better, develop the skills, okay? Handle the upcoming winters. Don't wish away the winters. That's called naive. 
wish for the skills, wish for the strength, wish for the wisdom. Here's the second major lesson in life to learn. Learn how to take advantage of the spring. Uniquely enough, spring follows winter. And pray tell how often? Six and a half thousand times. I mean, those are good odds. I'd gamble on it one more time. I mean, those are good odds. Every time, you can't beat those odds. Spring is called opportunity. Another day is called opportunity. Days follow nights. How about that? And how often? Every day. But now here's what we must learn to do with opportunity. Underline two strategic words in that sentence. Take advantage. Just, sp the, uh, just because spring comes is no sign you're going to look good in the fall. You've got to take advantage of it. You've got to do something with it. Read every book you can on what to do with your springs, what to do with your opportunities, what to do with your days, what to do with your chances. Don't miss the educational process. Don't miss the process of learning to understand opportunity keeps coming. But the key is taking advantage, taking advantage. Everybody in this room has got to learn to do one of two things, plant in the spring or beg in the fall. And it doesn't mean you can't become a sophisticated beggar, but you don't need the reputation. Learn to plant in the spring, take advantage. And there's an urgency here on springtime because there's just a few springs, handful of springs offered to each of us. So take advantage swiftly and quickly. Don't just let the time pass. The Beatles wrote, life is very short. And for John Lennon, it was extra short. For Michael Landon, it was extra short. But life is short. At the longest, it's short. So don't just let the springs pass, pass, pass. Take advantage. Seize the day. Seize the moment. Seize the opportunity. That's the key. Springtime. Life is fragile. Life is brief. Elton John sings she lived her life like a candle in the wind. It's fragile. It's brief. Whatever you're going to do, you've got to get at it. Don't just let it pass away. Here's major lesson number three. In the summer, learn how to nourish and protect. We've got two challenges in the summer in the personal development part of our life. And that is become capable and powerful enough in the summer and wise enough in the summer to nourish what's good and defend yourself against what's bad. Nourish and defend. The summertime is an interesting time. It holds the possibility of the promise of harvest time, but it also has the possibility of the threat. Sure enough, as soon as you've planted your garden, the busy bugs and the noxious weeds are out to take it. And let me give you another word of advice. They will take it unless you prevent it. Summertime is an interesting time. Best as I can describe summertime, you've got to nourish your values like a mother. Nourish like a mother. Go after the threat to the values you've got like a father. Deal with the weeds. Kill the weeds. Nourish the garden and kill the weeds. That's called summertime. What a challenging time. Give life like a mother. Take life like a father. Summertime. You've got to deal with the negative as well as the positive. Summertime is a unique, complex mix of positive and negative. Opportunity and threat. What a scenario of life itself. Opportunity and threat to the opportunity. And you've got to deal with both. You've got to think positive and you've got to think negative. You've got to handle what's ever out to threaten you. You've got to learn to threaten it back. Summertime. Interesting time. Nourish like a mother. Defend like a father. You've got to be like your bloodstream in the summer. Red corpuscles to what? Nourish. White corpuscles to what? Fight. You've got to both nourish and fight. You've got to nourish and be vigilant. Okay. White corpuscles think negative. You can't just think positive. We call you naive. 
Somebody says, well, I've been taught to be all positive. You'll be some kind of freak. You can't be all positive. Thank God for white corpuscles that think negative all day. Guess what white corpuscles are looking for all day? Problems, infection. White corpuscles say, just show me some infection, I'll kill it. <laughs> Why? It's out to kill the body. It's out to kill our chances. It's out to kill our future. Whatever threatens us, we threaten. I'm asking you to take sword to your enemies. Whatever's out to threaten you, threaten your health, you gotta threaten it back. Like white corpuscles. Kill what's evil. Nourish what's good. Love like a mother. Hate like a father. Father says to whatever threatens his family, take two or three more steps toward this family and threaten my family, you'll cease to exist. I'm father, I kill. <laughs> Don't let the weeds take your garden. Wreck your chances for a good harvest. Deal with your enemies in the summer. Called good and evil. The great struggle in life is called good and evil. Tyranny and liberty. Sickness and health. It's the way life is. Tyranny threatens liberty. Takes over Kuwait. Can't have that. If tyranny takes Kuwait, it'll take Saudi Arabia. If it takes Saudi Arabia, it'll take something else. Where are we going to stop tyranny? As soon as possible. Lest it take the whole world value. So George Bush draws a line in the sand, consults with its allies, sends a half a million troops to Saudi Arabia. Finally, Desert Sword, Desert Storm, takes on Saddam Hussein, drives him out of Kuwait. Why? Because it has to be done. The great struggle between liberty and tyranny, the great struggle between evil and good. And you've got to treat your own life the same. Says Saddam Hussein, you can't have Kuwait. Can't have Saudi Arabia. Furthermore, we're going to kick you out. Hires chief white corpuscle, General Schwarzkopf. <laughs> Takes care of the matter. I'm asking you in the summer, nourish like a mother. Threaten whatever threatens you like a father. Now, you can also turn around the scenario. That's true. Love like a father. Hate like a mother. Give life like a father. Take life like a mother. You can turn the scenario around. The key is both love and hate. Single parents have got the greatest challenge. Love like a mother, hate like a father. Love like a father, hate like a mother. Nothing more dangerous than an angry mother. <laughs> Beware the female species of the animal. They call her black widow spider. Why? Because when she finishes, there is no male spider. <laughs> I saw this article. I was flying on an airplane up in Canada. I saw this article in one of the airplane magazines. Showed a picture of this guy with his shirt off, these claw marks down his back, teeth marks in his neck. The guy almost got killed. He was out in the woods, saw a mama bear with her little cub. Said, oh, this looks cute. Had his flash camera, went flash, flash, took a picture. Mama bear treats it unkindly, promptly chases him. Caught him, almost killed him before they got to him. Beware, mama bear. So, love like a father, hate like a mother. However you want to treat this scenario. It's very important. It's called summertime. Part of the personal development challenge is to be challenged to learn to nourish all of your values from a garden to a family relationship, to a love affair, to a marriage, to a business. Anything that's valuable to you called equity. You've got to nourish it. You've got to feed it. You've got to take care of it. But you've also got to defend it. It's called the way things are. Key. In the summer. Now here's number four. Fourth major lesson in life to learn. In the fall, in the harvest, learn to reap in the harvest without complaint. Important part of personal development. Reap in the harvest without complaint. Take full responsibility 
Once you've learned this scenario, it's not the seed, it's not the soil, it's not the sunshine, it's not the rain, it's not the miracle of the giving of life, it's not the seasons that's to be criticized. We must take personal responsibility. So in the harvest, take personal responsibility. It's your crop. Whatever you've reaped, it's your crop. Take responsibility. No complaint. And here's the next one. No apology. The best of human maturity is no apology if you've done well. And no complaint if you haven't. Knowing that that's where the answers lie. Within and then without in the miracle of the possibilities that we have to work with. Those are the four major lessons in life to learn. Let's talk about some more parts of personal development. Here's the first one. Physical. The physical side. Got to take care of yourself. Do not neglect to take care of yourself. Good phraseology used in the Bible, in my amateur way, but let me put it to you best I can. Here's what it says. Treat your body like a temple. That's a good phrase, good suggestion. A temple meaning something you take extremely good care of. A temple. That's a good phrase. Treat your body like a temple, not a woodshed. A temple, a temple. Take good care. It's the only place you've got to live currently. The temple. Nutrition, my mother studied nutrition, passed it along to me, passed it along to my father, my children, my grandchildren. What a legacy that was. Learning to just take care of your stuff. Key phrase, some people don't do well because they don't feel well. They've got the gifts, they've got the skills. Maybe they just haven't taken care of themselves. They don't have the vitality. Key phrase, vitality is a major part of success. Vitality. So take care of yourself. I know a guy that raises racehorses. I'm telling you, the guy feeds his horses better than he feeds himself. He's so careful how he feeds his horses. He's so careful what they eat. He's so careful that they get everything. And because of that extreme care, I mean, these are magnificent animals. They can run like the wind. But you ought to see this guy. <laughs> Ten steps up a flight of stairs, and I mean, he's all out of breath. His horses can run like the wind, and he can hardly make it up the steps. The guy takes care of his animals better than he takes care of himself. Some people feed their dogs better than they feed their kids. physical now there's all kinds of parts to physical here's one appearance it's part of the physical never have a second chance to make a first impression the physical side and here's some of the best advice on appearance I can give you it comes from ancient script again it says God looks on the inside people look on the outside isn't that good information? Now you say, well, people shouldn't judge you by how you look. Well, let me give you a clue. They do. <laughs> they do. You can't deal in these shoulds and shouldn'ts. You'll be tipped over the rest of your life. Now, of course, when people get to know you, they'll judge you by more than what they see. But at first, they're going to take a look. So, here's the best advice I can give you. Make sure the outside is a major reflection of what's going on inside. The physical side. A few minutes a day, stay healthy. A little bit of nourish, a little bit of study on nutrition, stay healthy. Key. Now, here's the next part of personal development, the spiritual part. Now, I'm an amateur on the spiritual side. I do happen to believe that human beings are more than just an advanced life form. an advanced species of the animal kingdom. I, I do believe humans are a special creation. That's just my personal belief, and I don't ask you to buy it. 
But here's what I do ask you to buy. If you do believe in spirituality in any manner, here's my best advice. Study it and practice it. Do not neglect your values. Do not neglect your virtues. If you do believe in spirituality, my advice is study it and practice it. Don't let it go unstudied. Don't let it go unnourished, if you do believe. That's my best advice on the spiritual side. Now here's the third part. The mental side. Part of this personal development challenge is to develop mentally. Learn, study, grow, change. It's what schooling is all about. And the human development takes time, incredible amounts of time. That's why we've taken the time for this seminar. It just takes time. Some things you can't cover in a 20-minute speech. You can't cover in a little five-minute talk. It takes time. For humans, it takes seem like more time than any other life form human beings. The little wildebeest in Africa. Guess how much time it's got as soon as it's born to be able to run with the pack so it doesn't get eaten by the lions. Guess how much time it's got? A few minutes. As soon as the little wildebeest is born, tries to stand up, falls down. Its mother nudges it, gets it to stand back up, falls back down. Finally on little shaky legs, it tries to nurse, mother pushes it away, she moves away, so it can't nurse. Why, it can't nurse now, you've got to develop some strength now. The lions, the lions, the lions. Falls down, gets back up, tries to nurse, mother pushes it away. No, you've got to get these legs strong. How much time have we got? Not much time, Mama Wildebeest says. Not much time. Not hours. Not days, minutes. Wow. But the human baby, wow. After 16 years, we're not sure. Right? <laughs> Unbelievable amount of time it takes. So it does take time for personal development. It does take time for spiritual development, physical development. But here's also what takes time, and that's your mental development feeding the mind, nourishing the mind. Some people read so little, they got rickets of the mind. They couldn't give you a good strong argument as to their own personal beliefs. Here's one of the challenges we've got as parents, and that is to get our kids ready to debate the major life issues of the 90s. They've got to get ready to debate. We've spent this last couple of decades debating communism. Communism taught capital belongs in the hands of the state. We've been teaching, no, capital belongs in the hands of the people. Communism taught. People are too dumb and stupid to know what to do with capital. You gotta take capital away from all the dumb, stupid people and give it to the all-knowing, all-wise state and let the state run everything and let the people meekly show up for their work assignment. All glory to the state, communism taught. Kid says, well, is that right? No, all glory to the people. Let the state be the servant of its people, not the people be the servant of the state. I'm telling you, you've got to be able to pick up those ideologies. You've got to be able to pick up the philosophy. And here's the next part. You've got to be able to defend it. If you can't defend your virtues and if you can't defend your values, I'm telling you, even in the 90s, you'll fall prey to philosophies that are not in your best interest. And we've got to help our teenagers, we've got to help our kids especially to be able to debate the major life issues, the political issues and the social issues and the religious issues and the spiritual issues and the nutritional issues and, and the economic issues and all of the rest of the issues that are valuable for us to build the kind of equities we want. You got to get yourself ready. And one of the ways you got to get ready is not just physical and not just spiritual. You got to get ready mentally. And this is where Schof went to work on me, to be ready mentally to develop the philosophy and also be able to defend your virtues and your values. Let's go through it. You need a good library. Schof got me started on my library. Here's one of the books he recommended, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. 
think and grow rich. Shove said to me, doesn't that book and title intrigue you? Think and grow rich. Don't you have to read that book? Think and grow rich. I said, yes, sir. By Napoleon Hill. I went and found that book in a used bookstore. That's where I had to start. In a used bookstore. I paid less than 50 cents for it. I've still got it. It's one of the rare hardback covers. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Wow, Shof was right. Get a library started. It'll change your life. Any home over $200,000 has got a library. Why do you suppose that is? Wouldn't that make you curious? How come every home over $200,000 has got a library? Does that tell you something? Does that educate you at all? You say, well, I can't afford a $200,000 home. It doesn't matter what size home. Take your present apartment, clean out a closet, call it your library, and start acting intelligent. <laughs> and start this process like I did. Start developing a library. Here's what your library needs to show, that you're a serious student of health and life, spirituality, culture, uniqueness, sophistication, economics, prosperity, productivity, sales, management, skills, values of all kind. Let your library show you're a serious student. Don't be casual in learning. Don't be lazy in learning. Information is the key. Okay. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of health. Learning is the beginning of prosperity. Learning is the beginning of democracy, the beginning of freedom. All values, all virtues start with the learning process. So don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in gathering the library that will teach you and instruct you. And I got that book, Think and Grow Rich. Some of the ideas in that book inspired me no end, helped me to change my life. Now, it's got some weird stuff in it. You know, it's got some weird stuff. Napoleon was weird, so you got to... <laughs> Separate out a little of this weird stuff, but you can do that. You can separate out the weird stuff, okay? Unless you're weird, just do the weird stuff. <laughs> anyway. Remember, don't be a follower, be a student. That's the key to all books. Don't be a follower, be a student. Okay. Another book he recommended. Help me become financially independent. We're going to cover that before we finish this afternoon. The book was entitled, The Richest Man in Babylon. The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson, C-L-A-S-O-N. This little book, The Richest Man in Babylon, I use it as a textbook teaching teenagers how to be rich by 40, living in America, 35 if you're extra bright, much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. I got rich by the time I was 31, didn't wait till 35. If you find a unique opportunity. So we'll get into that after we come back from our next break. Richest man of Babylon. Get your library started. Here are some key sections to put in your library called mental food. In fact, we call it food for thought. It's so important to nourish the mind, not just the body, but nourish the mind. Key phrase. Now it needs to be well balanced. You can't live on mental candy. Somebody says, well, I just read this positive stuff. That's too second grade. You've got to get out of second grade. You can't just be inspired. You've got to be taught. You can't just be inspired. You've got to be educated. Key. Here's a good book. It's called How to Read a Book. Good title. How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. In this book, How to Read a Book, Mortimer, you know, is the, is the chief editor of the new Encyclopedia Britannica. A good set of books, right, to have in your library. Encyclopedia Britannica, chief editor, Mortimer Adler. He's, still in, he's in his 80s. He's still active, still writing books. I've got several of his books, The Six Great Ideas, a lot of books, Mortimer Adler. But he wrote this book, How to Read a Book. Now, in this book, How to Read a Book, not only does he give you some good suggestions on how to get the most out of a book, 
It's one thing to read it, it's another thing to get the best out of it. He'll give you some techniques on how to get the best out of a book. It's very good. But here's what's also in his book, How to Read a Book, a list of what he calls the best writings ever written. The best writings ever written. I've used it as a centerpiece for my library. So I'm just asking you, take a look. If it suits you, fine. If it doesn't suit you, hey, keep looking until you find something to suit you. But well balanced. Let me give you some of that balance. Number one, history. We've all got to have a sense of history. American history, national history, international history, family history, political history. We all need a sense of history. Shortest history lesson, opportunity mixed with difficulty. No matter how far back you go, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, three thousand, four thousand years ago, I'm telling you, it all reads the same. Once you understand the thread that it isn't going to change, then what's going to change for my life? Answer, looks like I'm going to have to change. History helps us to understand how it is, what there is to work with, seed, soil, sunshine, rain, and what human beings have done with it in the past. And how many of them have, like I did by age 25, they have messed up. That's what history's for. Be a good student of history. Here's a good book, Lessons of History by Durant. Lessons of History by Durant. This little book is only 100 pages, but I'm telling you, it's so well written, you'll be intrigued as I was. This little book, Lessons of History by Durant. Next is philosophy. Durant also wrote a good book on philosophy. The story of philosophy. It's got a good rundown of the key philosophers of the last several hundred years, what they taught and some of the lives they lived. You might find it a little difficult, but hey, you can't just read the easy stuff. Key phrase to add here in parenthesis, don't just read the easy stuff. You won't grow. You won't change. You won't develop. Tackle the more difficult stuff. Next, novels. Novels are good. Sometimes an intriguing story keeps our attention so that the author can weave in the philosophy he or she is trying to get across. Anne Rand was probably better at that than anybody else I could possibly think of. Atlas shrugged some of those towering novels. The novel kept us intrigued, but guess what she was doing all the time? Feeding us her philosophy, feeding us her philosophy. Now, whether you agreed with her philosophy or not, you had to admit she was really good at getting it out there, weaving it through the story, in the dialogue and in the speeches and in the text. Fabulous. Novels. Novels are good. Now, here's a little personal advice. Skip the trash. I mean, you don't. Someone says, well, sometimes you can find something valuable in a trashy novel. I wouldn't go through it to find it. You can find a crust of bread in a garbage can, but I wouldn't go through it. <laughs> Number one, you don't need the reputation. So not enough time to read the brilliant stuff, the good stuff. Skip the trash, really. My personal advice on personal development, becoming more valuable than you are. Next is biographies and autobiographies, the story of stories of successful people, unsuccessful people. There's some dramatic stuff, right? Over the last hundred years, it's been written, biographies and autobiographies. Here's one of the best, the Bible. The Bible is a unique book because it's got a list of human stories on one side of the ledger, another list of human stories on the other side of the ledger. One's called examples, and the other's called warnings. And here's what we've got to have on biographies and autobiographies, both warnings and examples. In the Bible, the examples, the Bible says, look at these people's lives, follow them, follow their philosophy, follow their advice. Then we've got the warnings, right? Don't do what these people did. They messed up their life and threw their life away. Vitally important, both sides of the scenario. Now, if your life story ever gets in one of those books, make sure they use it as an example, not a warning. Also, we need balance, both sides, balance, good and evil, biographies, autobiographies.
You need a book on Gandhi? You need a book on Hitler. One to illustrate how high a human being can go, and the other one to illustrate what? How low and despicable a human being can become. We need both sides of the scenario. Next, accounting. Got to have a little, at least primary view of accounting. Kids have got to start learning the difference between a debit and a credit. Next is law. We all need, right, a little bit. You don't have to be a lawyer, but you got to know contracts, what to sign, what not to sign, backups, good advice, how to be safe rather than sorry. All of us need a little law, not a lawyer, but a little law, especially these complicated days. Everything's in court these days. I learned this the hard way. company wanted to borrow money a long time ago up in Canada company wanted to borrow some money the bank said well yes we will loan the company the money if Mr. Roan will sign personally and I wanted to play hero and I knew the company could pay it back a quarter of a million dollars so I signed no problem sure enough within less than a year they paid it all back a quarter of a million dollars I am now a hero. Well, about a year later, this company gets in financial trouble. They go back to the bank and borrow this quarter of a million dollars again. I said, I hope my phone doesn't ring because I won't sign the note this time. Because I knew they were in trouble. I knew they were probably going to go bankrupt. My phone never rang. I'm off the hook. Sure enough, within less than a year, the company goes bankrupt, can't pay. But I get this letter from the bank saying, Dear Mr. Rohn, since the company cannot perform its obligation and pay this quarter of a million dollars, and since we have here your personal guarantee, would you please send us your check for a quarter of a million dollars? I said, hey, hold it, hold it. There must be some mistake here. I signed that first note, and they paid it all back. I wouldn't have signed the second note. I didn't sign the second note. Well, what I didn't know I had originally signed was a continuing guarantee. So now I know what the word continuing means. <laughs> I'm asking you to study a little law, know what to sign, know how to defend yourself, right? Say, hey, we'll get back. Don't sign too quickly. I mean, there's all kinds of things here. Be a student. Don't be lazy in learning. How to defend as well as nourish. How to grow as well as take care of your enemies. You've got to learn. Let your library indicate that you're a serious student about personal relationships with your family, gifts and skills, economics, and all the rest. Here's the next one. Economics. We're going to study that when we come back from our break. Economics. We're going to cover, especially for the kids today, how to become financially independent. We're going to let the adults listen. I've been teaching kids for the last 18, 19 years how to be rich by 40, 35 if you're extra bright. Most kids think they're extra bright, they go for 35. Or much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. We're going to get into that. Be a student of economics. Next, culture, sophistication. Don't leave that out of your life culture, sophistication. Culture is part of the fabric of the nation. Culture is what makes us different than dogs and animals. Culture is what makes us different from the barbarians. Culture, sophistication. Be a student of the dance and the art and the music and all the rest of those extraordinary human values that are possible for us all to participate in as well as to enjoy. Be a student of culture. And the last one is spirituality. Study it from the Bible and all the related books about spirituality. If you're a believer, study and practice. Let your library show you're a serious student. Next, Q. 
keep a journal. Shelf said, Mr. Owen, not only be a student, but the good ideas that you develop from the books. Keep a separate journal. Write all this stuff down. Here's what he said. Don't trust your memory. If you're serious about becoming wealthy and powerful and sophisticated and healthy, influential, cultured, unique, keep a journal. Don't trust your memory. If you listen to something valuable, write it down. If you come across something important, write it down. Write it down. Now, I used to take notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes and restaurant placemats and long sheets and narrow sheets and little sheets and pieces and thrown in a drawer. Found out, best way, keep a journal. I've been keeping these journals now since age 25. It makes up a valuable part of my own learning and it's a valuable part of my library. My own journals now form a good portion of my own library. The stuff. I'm trying to get kids to do like I do, be a buyer of empty books. Kids find it interesting I'd buy an empty book. Especially at my status in life. What'd I pay for this one? $26. <laughs> kids say, $26 for an empty book. <laughs> Why would you do that? Well, the reason I paid $26 is to press me, to see if I can't find something worth $26 to put in here. And I'm telling you, all my journals are private, but if you got a hold of one of my journals, you wouldn't have to look very far until you would say, this is worth more than $26. I must admit, if you got a glimpse of Mr. Rohn's journals, you'd have to say he is a serious student. Not just committed to his craft, but committed to life, committed to skills, committed to learning, to see what I can do with seed and soil and sunshine and rain and miracle and possibilities and turn it into equities of life and treasure, family relationships, enterprise, sales, management, gifts galore, everything you want, all available, especially in America. I'm asking you, keep a journal. I call it one of the three treasures to leave behind. Let me give you that. One of the three treasures to leave behind. Number one is your pictures. Take a lot of pictures. Did you ever look back, right? Two or three generations, just a handful of photographs way back there. Wouldn't it be something if there was album after album, thousands of pictures to help tell the story? A picture's worth a thousand words. Don't be lazy in capturing the event. How long does it take to capture the event? A fraction of a second. How long does it take to miss the event? A fraction of a second. Errors in judgment or disciplines, take lots of pictures, help tell the story. Click, click, got it, click, click, got it, keep. I go to Taiwan to lecture, Taipei, Taiwan, Grand Hotel, neat place to do a weekend seminar. I got a thousand students. Guess how many cameras? <laughs> One thousand cameras. 